If you would turn, uh, let's go back to the beginning, start at verse number one there. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Right, so right away he's talking about receiving and hiding, right? There's, there's, a, there's a pattern in Proverbs I want everybody to notice as you read through on a daily basis is the connection, and we saw it in chapter one, between, between wisdom coming from God's word. Look what he says in verse two. He says, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. Again, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. All of these things come from the word of God. These words are tied together. As you read through the Proverbs, and these are some action words here about receiving and hiding, inclining, applying, criest after, lift us up. He says, how do you get wisdom? It's up to you to get it. How do you become a smarter human being? By studying God's word, by making the effort of opening it up and, and learning it for yourself. So wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are all tied together. If you remember in chapter one, he says that wisdom crieth without. Wisdom is yelling, saying, hey, Get me, get some wisdom. This is God's wisdom that he wants us to get. But here, notice what he says in verse three. He says, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifted, lift us up thy voice for understanding. So how do we answer that call? By our own call, right? It's kind of like salvation, right? There, he's called and it's up to you to call and make that election sure, right? So it's up to you to actually get the wisdom by heeding that call by answering the call and then making it your own action your own be active in calling unto wisdom asking for God asking God for wisdom as we saw in Samuel 1 it, it makes me think about in 1 Samuel 3 actually uh, with the story of Samuel as he was born where God kept calling him right imagine wisdom hey you need wisdom hey answer me and finally he was instructed and the Lord called and then he said here am I right it wasn't until Samuel said here am I. He called back to the Lord that Samuel you know, answered that call. And it's the same way with us. As Christians, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have the Word of God at your fingertips. God has given you everything you need to increase in knowledge and understanding, to attain unto understanding and have that wisdom. So how do you do it? You answer the call of wisdom by opening your own mouth and calling unto the Lord. Lord, I don't know what this passage means. I, I need your help. Lord, help me to understand what this is. Lord, help me to obey the words, the things that I see. So you have to cry yourself. You have to make that call. Look at verse 4. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure, as for hid treasure. Look, I mean, if you're looking for gold, if you're looking for silver, if you're looking for treasure, you're going to be very serious about it. It's going to be the biggest priority you have. If somebody told you that there was silver in your backyard tomorrow morning, would it be dug up? Would you just kind of put it off and say, you know, one day I'm going to get out there with the shovel and we're going to do something about it. We're going to get some of that silver. Or would you be actively pursuing it, searching after it, doing everything you can to find that? Think about it. As treasure, this is spiritual treasure. It's knowledge of the holy it's understanding the word of god it's the wisdom that comes from god but it's up to you to search for it i want you to go to romans chapter 12 romans chapter 12 keep your finger right there listen growth is a choice growth is a choice you have to you have to choose to want it you have to choose to love it you have to search actively you have to make it a priority all these words we just read it's actively pursuing it's it's being you know these are action words inclining applying receiving and hiding and and god wants us to have more talents as a christian more gifts more blessings but if we disobey his word we simply will not have it if we're not searching in his word we will not have those blessings and, you know, there are spiritual gifts. God uses different people for different things in the church. And yet he has commanded us to desire certain gifts. If you don't want it, you, you won't get it. It's plain and simple. You know, in Corinthians, he says, covet earnestly the best gifts. What's he talking about? He says he, he wishes that we would uh, excel to edifying the church. He says, covet to prophesy. He goes on and says, you know, so the desire is that you would be able to preach the word of God and explain it to somebody. Do you know how many Christians there are out there that just cannot explain things? 
I mean, we, are, we probably all know Christians like this in our family or friends, that if you said, hey, explain this verse, or if somebody at work said, you're a Christian, aren't you? Well, well can you explain what this means? Most of them, because they're not in the Word, they're not searching for wisdom, they have no clue. They're, uh, I don't know, uh, let's look, let's see what it says. I don't know, you know. Most Christians are not able to understand, and therefore they're not able to prophesy. They can't turn around and teach somebody else. But God wants us to covet to prophesy. God wants us to desire better spiritual gifts. And He wants to give you more talent. God wants to give you more responsibility in life. God wants to give you more wisdom, and the only way you're going to get any of those things is to search for it with your whole heart, to make it a priority. Look here in Romans chapter 12, look at verse number 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Right? Your job as a Christian is to hate sin, is to hate the lust of the flesh, the, the pride of life, the things that are going to hold you back. These are steps to getting more gifts. And this is how he starts out. What is your reasonable service now that you're saved? He's purchased your soul. Right, It's sealed unto the day of redemption. He says, now I want you to deal with your body. I want you to deal with your mind, your desires. What are you searching for? Look at the next verse. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants you to transform. He wants you to change. He wants you to reset your mind. He wants you to wash your mind in the water of the word, right, from the, from the filthiness of the world. He wants you to understand what his perfect will is for your life. You know, there are many Christians that are, you know, the, the, the body is, is, is the church, right? And it's like there's a, a, an arm out there just floating around or an eyeball just floating around. It's not connected to anything. They, they're aimless. They have no goal. They don't know what their purpose is in life. Many Christians are just like an, a, an island where they don't know, are they might connect to anybody? What's over there? I don't know. Look, as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, it's your goal to be part of the body, to edify, to grow, and you start by looking in. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 7. How do we judge out? We judge in first, right? You need to make it a priority to judge yourself. As Christians, we're commanded to judge, and we're commanded, first of all, to judge inside of ourselves. If you won't fix the little things in your life, then why, do you, why, why would you expect God to give you power to fix the big things? You have to be willing to turn your head, to turn your way, to transform your life. If you're not, then why would you ask for God's blessing? Listen, to find wisdom as a Christian, to grow as a person, it starts in your own heart. Finding, look at what he says, your perfect will of God for you as an individual. Go to verse number 6. Romans 12, 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. The first time soul winner has about that much faith that they're able to do it. You know how many times I've been to the door with somebody and they're like, I don't know, I'll try. I, I might be able to knock and say my name. And I try to coach them, I try to help them. You know, hey, increase your faith. The disciples said, Lord, add to our faith. Right, we're commanded that. You know, so, so what do you do? You, according to the proportion of your faith is your ability to preach. If you as a soul winner say, well, I'm just not that good, I can't reach people, I'm rusty, I haven't been doing it, then you've put the confidence in yourself. The proportion of your faith ought to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are spiritual gifts. These things are given to God in your spirit as a blessing for obeying Him, right? For transforming your life, for abiding by the Scriptures, learning the Scriptures. Look, if you're a soul winner and you're not very confident, but you know the Word of God, you need to increase the proportion of your faith. Look what he, to, to prophecy, he says, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. If you think, well, I, all I can do is get the low-hanging fruit, well then, why are you staying on the bottom shelf? It's up to you. If you say, you know what, God will give me the verses that I can't even, I couldn't write it down right now. If you said, how would you answer this question? Maybe you wouldn't have it then, but in the situation of you prophesying in the will of God, obeying that perfect will, God will bring verses to your remembrance through the Holy Spirit. So don't, your, your confidence is in the Holy Spirit. 
Your trust is in the Lord. The power is in the scriptures. It's not in yourself. It's up to your proportion of faith. You can increase that. Hey, just turn the knob. Turn the dial. Add a little faith. Well, but Brother Fannin, I can't just go up there. Well, you've already convinced yourself, right? You're asking, a, you know, you're double-minded. You're unstable. You're wavering. Well, maybe I should. Maybe I should. Just say, hey, I will, and God will provide, right? He says, increase the proportion of your faith. Look at verse 7. Or of ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. He lists off these talents, these gifts that God wants to give you. I want to grow you spiritually, and it starts by you purifying yourself, right? Increasing your faith, trusting that God can use you. Well, you just don't know my past. Hey, you don't know how big God is. If you think that your past is bigger than God's forgiveness, then, then you've missed the boat. Look, God wants to use you. He ends, in verse 9 there, he sort of changes gears, but he says, let love be without dissimulation. Don't, be, don't have fake love. Don't be one of these two-faced Christians. Oh, how are you guys doing? And then you tell you, well, I can't stand that guy. Look, if you have a problem with somebody, pray for them. Find, find a way to be a blessing to them. But he says, abhor that which is evil. What does abhor mean? It means to hate. God wants you, how do you get more spiritual gifts? You hate that which is evil. You have to hate the evil. Do you want to see God grow in your, do you want to see things happen in your life? Do you want to see more souls saved and you be more effective at preaching? Hate that which is evil. Starting with yourself, right? Hate the sin that gets you. Learn to deal with your own problem. Well, Brother Fannin, you just don't know. I've struggled with this for years and I just can't quite kick, hey, hate that which is evil. Is it destroying your life? Is it destroying your mind? Is it polluting your thoughts? Is it hindering your flesh? Then it's not of God. You need to hate it. You need to say, God, this problem, I want you to help me to hate it. Step one, clean up your life. And then God will give you more gifts, more gifts spiritually. Go back to Proverbs chapter two. He says, cleave to that which is good. Listen, if you're not around the right people, then that's gonna hold you back. Cleave to that which is good. You know, the Bible talks about it, it being addicted to the ministering of the saints. You know, somebody that has a goal of learning a doctrine or reading through the Bible, it's like, it's like on their mind every waking moment. You know, I mean, if you're passionate, and I've met people that they're like video gamers, and all they can think about, as soon as they wake up, they want to play this game. What if we treated the Bible that way, yeah. right? There are business owners that have that mentality, right? I'm going to check my stocks. Hey, are you coming to bed? It's 1230. Well, I'm going to see what's happening in the China market. What in the world? You know, the money matters the most, right? Is your business the most important? Is your family the most? Listen, wisdom will fix everything in your life. And if you have a desire to get wisdom, if you say, God, I want to hate the evil in my life. I want to love the good. I want to be passionate about reading the Bible. Then you'll go to bed reading it. You'll wake up reading it. You'll find an extra five minutes at lunchtime. You're going to open it up and read it and search for something else. Like it's hid treasure. Like you're just, whoa, I found this verse answers my question. This verse helps me to help somebody else. This verse provides understanding and knowledge and ultimately wisdom so that you have more spiritual gifts. Those verses are in there that in your life, in your walk as a Christian, you're going to come across them and it's, it's like a landmine. It's like you just hit it and it's like... Like, whoa, do you, do, you, do you see what this means? You tell your wife, and she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. And you're like, no, no, but this is big. You, you tell your buddy, you text somebody, I don't know, this verse is something else, you know? And they see it, well, sure, I see it at face value, but to you, it's that bit of wisdom you've been searching for. You found it like it's hid treasure, and now all of a sudden your understanding is increased. You can prophesy better. You can, you can function better. So there's all these little nuggets of knowledge throughout the Bible. Are you looking for those nuggets? Or are you just kind of casually, well, I read that. I've already read this once. What's the big deal? No, you need to be diligent. You need to be searching for these things. You need to be passionate about reading the Bible because then God will give you more spiritual gifts. Then you'll find His will in His life, in your life. In Philippians 3, He says, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things that were before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is a mark. 
There is a goal. There is a prize. There is an end game. There is treasure hidden in these verses. Are you looking for it? Is it the biggest priority you have? Hey, because if not, you need to get it. You need to get on fire for it. You need to get excited about it. And the more zeal you have for the word of God, the more the Lord will reveal to you. Go back to verse number one in Proverbs chapter two. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Right? He's saying, get it. Put it in your heart. Keep it in your heart. He said, so that thou incline thine ear to wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Right? Go get it. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure. Here's the culmination. Look at this. Verse 5. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So when you're searching, when you're looking, when you're lifting up, when you're applying, when you're doing all these things, and when you begin to say, God, I want to hate the sin, I want to hate the problems I have, I want to love the good, I want to love good people, I want to love godliness, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. You know what the fear of the Lord is? Being afraid he's going to take his blessing away from you. Being afraid he's going to correct you for breaking his law, loving him for being a correcting father, and obeying what he says. Once you understand the fear of the Lord, then you can begin to find the knowledge of God. Listen, wisdom comes to those that are looking for it. Are you looking for wisdom? Are you looking for something to watch on TV? Are you looking for some sin to get into? Are you looking for a buzz? Are you looking for a good time? Are you looking for entertainment? Are you looking for free time? What are you looking for? A dream home? A better car? Look, those are physical things. God will give you everything you need. When you focus on those, you lose the spiritual things. When you focus on the spiritual, God will take care of all the other things. He'll change the desire of your heart. There, there are things that you used to want, right? And I mean, I don't care how far back you go. When you were a child, you wanted candy, all right? Most of us adults don't wake up and say, ooh, candy, I want candy, right? We, that's not how we operate. But there are things that as a teenager that we probably really wanted, we thought, man, if I could just get some of that, I would be set. I'd have everything. If I can get this and that and that, I'd be good. And now here you are five years later, and you're like, I don't even care for that anymore. God will change the desire of your heart. He'll give you the wisdom and understanding to know what really matters, spiritually speaking. Look at verse number six. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Here's the goal. God wants to give you wisdom. It's out of his mouth, which we find in his word, that we see the understanding, the knowledge. It's all right here. Look at verse seven. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Right? This is a cool verse. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. I have a guy, a buddy of mine, that he collects silver. Like, he stacks silver. That's what you call it. You stack silver coins, and next week he buys more, and he's all about it. And he's got some silver laid up in his closet. He's got some silver laid up in his parents' barn. He's got some silver laid up in his buddy's house. He dug a hole. He's laying up for a time. You know, when it happens, you know, I got all this silver all over the plate. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe that'll work for him. I don't know, you know. But he's laying up that treasure. It's in store, right? Laying up just in the same way that you would, like, have canning jars of pickles, well, pickles are expensive, but if you get the, you get the, uh, the what, what, what do they call them? Pressure cooker. Pressure cooker? Yeah, that's a good start. If you, get, if you make them yourself, if you get all the ingredients and put it together and you do it the way you like it, you can make your own pickles that taste better than the stuff at the store. There's no pesticide in there. You're, you're, getting, the, you're getting everything you want. And then you can lay that up and you can say, well, I've got pickles for five years to come. Well, God is saying to those that incline their ear unto wisdom, to those that cry after it and search after it, God will lay up wisdom. Can you imagine if somebody just said, you know what, this next year, I'm going to dedicate my life to finding wisdom. Every day I'm going to ask God to give me wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Help me to have the fear of the Lord. Help me to hate the evil and love the good. And I'm going to make that goal every day this year. I'm going to do it for a whole year straight. Ten years from now, you will be still blessed from what you did in that one year. He's saying that this is something that lays up and stays with you. It will transform who you are. 
Look what he says in the second half of that verse. He says, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. A buckler is a shield, right? He is the buckler. Now, when you think of a shield, a guy in the military, like he's got this shield, he's working around it, he's trying to be in battle. But God is that shield. If you decide, I will walk uprightly, then God will become your shield. You don't have to hold the shield. He will hold the shield. Listen, this whole chapter is about walking uprightly, staying in the good paths, the path of life versus the path of death, the path of darkness, the path of the evil man, right? Every step you take in life is part of your path. You have one path. You can go this way, you can go that way, but the path is the same. There's a line behind you through time, and that is your life. And at any point, you can choose to get off the path. You guys are here at church on a Wednesday night. You've decided, hey, I want to be in the house of the Lord. I want to be on the path of the righteous. I want to be upright in what I do. I want to do the right things every step that I take. And the devil's trying to whisper in your ear. He's trying to tempt you. He's trying to get you to go to the other path, right? So we have to continuously fight our own self in staying on the right path, not getting distracted. And he makes this point here that he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. If you're on the right path, you're in that perfect will of God, the arrows of the devil are going to bounce off of God's shield. If you decide to go the other way, guess what? All of a sudden, well, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I got in a wreck. Well, maybe you were out of the will of God. I don't know why this happened. Well, maybe you were out of the will of God. And a lot of times we, we, we take a step. Well, it's not that big of a deal. I've been in this path for so long. I'm so blessed to God. If I just step over here for a minute, boom, right? Guess what? That shield is not there anymore. God is your shield. It's not you that's holding the shield. God is putting it in front of you. You think about even with Job. He was protected every step of the way. Man, the devil did some damage to his life, though, didn't he? But what about Job? He was preserved. His wife was preserved. And through it all, Job did not sin, is what God tells us. Job, it starts out by introducing him, saying, He eschewed evil. Get away from me. I'm getting away. I don't want to be near it. Right? He wasn't, I don't believe he was passive. I believe he actively hated evil. He didn't want it in his house. He didn't want to walk into the house of an evil man. He tried to stay away from it. He probably rebuked people that came in his house with things. Hey, get out of here. Not in my house. You're not bringing those idols in here. Not bringing that wine in here. Get out. Right? Job was blessed of God. And even though he was tried and he came forth as gold, the devil sure did put an attack on him. But yet that shield was still there the whole time. And the devil had to ask for permission. We, you know, hey, he's got the hedge of protection around him. And God let it move back a little. He says, go ahead, watch. He's an upright man. That, he had character. It said he was upright throughout the whole thing. We need that shield of God to protect us. Without it, we've got nothing. Look at verse number 8. He says, he keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the ways of his saints. The paths of judgment. You make a judgment call every day of your life. The one thing that people complain the most about Christians is that we're judgmental. That same person is being judgmental. They're judging us saying, well, you believe in that book. You believe in that God. You don't believe in my textbook. You don't believe in my science professor. You know, that he teaches evolution. No, I don't. Right? Every day, every person makes judgment calls. It's the path of judgment is before you. What will you judge? When you leave here and you get to that road, you have to make a judgment call. Am I going left or am I going right? Plain and simple. When you get in the car, you have to make a judgment call. Will I put on my seatbelt? Will I turn my lights on? You make judgment calls every step of the way. And God is telling us to stay in the path of judgment. Because there are people that get passive. Well, I don't know. Anything will do. Look, that's not good judgment. Good judgment is to have a vision. We have a goal. We're going to get there. And the only way to get there is to stay on the right path. We have to judge every step of the way. When something comes up, you have to make a judgment call. Do I want to go this way or not? So consider that. There is a path of judgment, he says. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Again, he's talking about the protection. God's protecting you. You know, in Psalm 23, he says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. God wants to lead you in the right path, but it's up to you to make the judgment call, to make the right decision. Look at verse 9. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When you decide to stay in the path of judgment, 
You'll understand righteousness, what is right, what is wrong. You'll be able to judge those things affirmatively, what is right, what is wrong. You'll be able to have an even balance. You'll have equity in your life. You'll be able to make judgment calls for others. He says, yea, every good path. I mean, if, I just, if it was plain and simple, like on a computer, do I want the good path or the bad? Oh, I want the good path, of course. But yet as human beings, we go through life where the devil tempts us with things. The devil tempts us with the desire of our own flesh. Remember the Bible says you're drawn away of your own lust. It's that thing that you want that you can't say no to. I don't care if it's a bowl of ice cream, a, a video game, a website. There's things that your flesh wants and the devil knows it. God will never put you in that direction. God wants to try you for good. The devil wants to try, oh, look over here, come over here. You know, if you eat an extra bowl of ice cream at night, don't blame God, blame yourself. Don't even blame the devil, blame yourself. The problems we have in our life come from our own desire. And when you ask God to change your desire so you can stay on that good path, so you can have the path of judgment, so you can make the judgment calls, He'll bless you. You know, the Pharisees understood the law, but they did not understand judgment. They could not judge righteously. They judged by appearance instead of by the heart. In Matthew 23, says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. He says, everybody sees you putting even your pennies in the offering plate, but your heart is not right. You've omitted, you have discredited the most important part of the Word of God, and that is judgment, mercy, and faith. Hey, they weren't saved. They didn't have mercy, right? But or they didn't have faith, rather. They were not merciful to others. They were not judging righteously. They were judging selfishly. He tells them, these ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone. God's very clear. He wants us to be able to judge. A, a perfect Christian is somebody that is able to at least judge themselves so they can stay in the right path. If you're in the wrong path, it's because you're failing at judging. Look at verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. So it's God that gives us this wisdom. It comes from the Lord. It says, the Lord giveth wisdom in verse 6. Once you get it, once it begins to come into your heart, these things will protect you. You'll begin to make the right decisions. Hold your finger here and go to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, find verse number 12. It says, He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Right, so how is it discretion will preserve us, is what we read in chapter 2. A man of understanding holdeth his peace. You know, there's a time to just shut your mouth. There is a time to know when to be discreet and shut your mouth and be quiet and listen and observe and learn. Too many times we're eager to, oh, I got an answer for that. Well, I'm not talking about that. You've answered a matter before you heard it. It's folly unto you, right? Look, go to the next chapter, chapter number 12. Look at verse number 23. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. A prudent man concealeth knowledge. There's a time to be discreet, to use the discretion of the knowledge that you have. When wisdom enters into your heart, you're going to learn when to use your tongue and when not to use your tongue. Throughout the entire book of Proverbs, you're going to see a fool and his tongue over and over and over. You're going to see in practically every chapter the warning about a fool loving foolishness and saying stupid things and destroying themselves with their own mouth. So when he says that, that discretion will preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. When you begin to have wisdom, you know when to open your mouth and when to shut your mouth. You know when to step out and when to hold back. You know when to stay on the right path. Go back to Proverbs chapter 2. He says, When wisdom entereth in thy heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. Know when to be discreet. Know when to open your mouth. Know when to shut your mouth. Because you can't learn if your mouth is open. In Proverbs 17, he says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. 
And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. If you just sit there and be quiet and observe what's going on, somebody, well, man, this guy must know what, what he's doing. He's being real quiet. I've made the example before, you know, I've, I've had employees in different situations and I've been managers before in different situations and, and it's the guy that with confidence just, I can do it. It's the guy that, he's dependable, he's trustworthy, he gets it done, and he doesn't boast of what he's going to do, he just does it. He doesn't have to tell you how many times he's done it. It's the, the new guy that, oh yeah, I did that twice, I've done that twice, I can do a whole, well, I don't know, hold on, slow down, let's let somebody else that's a little more trustworthy do that. Look at verse number 12. Why do we need this to preserve us? Look at verse 12. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Right, so here's the goal, to help you avoid the fool, to deliver you out of the way of the evil man. Look, if you're on the right path, then you might not cross paths with a fool. Or when you do cross paths with a fool, you're prepared because the Lord is there to keep you, preserve you. He is there as your shield, your buckler. <laughs> the goal here is to stay away from stupid. Yeah. To stay away from stupid. Look, there's plenty of fools out there. There's plenty of stupid people. They come by this building all the time. They, they come by, look, I mean, I was, I was next door talking to our neighbor, and this lady comes in to ask for a job. Are you guys hiring for anything? And I mean, she looked cracked out. She had tattoos on her face and on her neck and she's sweating profusely and she can't hold still. And it's like, preserve thee from the foolish person, right? This is the goal of the word of the Lord, right? To have a little more common sense, to have some wisdom, to discern things, to understand what's going on so you know when to open your mouth or when to close your mouth. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man. Remember in chapter one, he talked about to not go with them. When, you know, when, when there are people trying to draw you away, don't go with them, right? Children, it's important to make good friends and to listen to what your parents have to say about who you associate with. Here it's saying there's a blessing if you can avoid the fool. Look at the next verse. He says, these fools, what do they do? It says, who leave the path of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness. Right? There are Christian children that grow up in churches that are not being, the churches are not instructing them properly. They're not telling them to get wisdom. They're telling them to be like the world. Be conformable to the world. Go, get a, go be just like the world so everybody will love you. And what happens? They leave the path of uprightness and they go to the path of darkness. They go hang out with a bunch of dark-hearted people. Look at verse 14. He says, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. When you're walking the path of darkness, you're going to be surrounded by people that rejoice to do evil. We're warned about avoid these people. You think they're your friend. You think, well, we're just going along having a good old time. We're just entertaining ourselves. We're just losing some sobriety. They're out to get you. They're out to hurt you. They're out to take anything they can from anybody. And they rejoice to do evil. They love nothing more than be able to go, ha, 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 we got him. We're warned about this evil person. We're warned about walking the paths of darkness. He says, delight in the frowardness of the wicked. They look forward to wickedness. Look, that's the people out there that are walking that path. They're a dime a dozen. They're easy to find. Finding somebody that's on fire for God, that loves the Lord, that loves His Word, that is rare. You want to find somebody that will deceive you and say, we're going to go have a good time, and then you end up getting hurt, messed with in your mind, robbed, defiled, go on out in the world. That's the way, that's the path of darkness. They're going to make it appealing. They're going to tell you, oh, it's, it's, it's great fun. No, it's not. It, it, sin is pleasurable for a season, and guess what? Then you have to answer to God. Then judgment comes. You know, said when they rejoice to do evil, where does this lead? When you walk with this type of person, you're going to learn their ways. You're going to rejoice to do evil, to hurt other people. You know, Romans 1, it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Those that rejoice to do evil... That's the person whispering in your ear, come on, just try it out. Hey, look, why don't you steal that guy's wallet? Hey, why don't you fill in the blank? Why don't you hurt that person? They're the person who are rejoicing to get you to rejoice to hurt somebody else. 
Listen, there are reprobates out there that, that just want, they want, oh, come on, it'll be pleasurable, it'll be a good time. Just walk like I'm walking, walk in some darkness, go on down to the bar with me. Look, beware of people like that. Our path should not cross their path. Well, no, you know, it should cross the path. It shouldn't be parallel to their path. When you're walking in their path, you're going their way, guess what? You're going to get hurt. They're going to steal from you. They're going to hurt you. They're going to destroy your life. In Isaiah 5, he warns, he says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. When I, when I was a child, I heard another child say, and this guy, he watched wrestling, and he had a super worldly guy. I remember when I was a child, I'm going way back, he listened to Guns N' Roses and liked wrestling, had a strange haircut, wore a leather jacket, and I'm talking fourth grade, and I remember how he would use the word wicked as if something is cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wicked! When I first heard, I was like, what in the world is this guy's problem? Wicked is bad. Now look, in my innocency, I, what, the, what I was taught by my parents is wickedness is bad. He was taught by his parents, by the path of darkness, that wicked means good. Right? He was calling good evil and evil good. I remember that guy distinctly, and I, I, I remember that. I mean, it was just like, why would you say that? People use words in the opposite just to harm others. You know, in Isaiah 5, he says also, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. These same people, they want to take away the righteousness of the righteous from them, right? They have pleasure in them to do them. They rejoice in evil. What do they want to do? They want to get you to become wicked, and they want to rejoice in that. They want to brag about what they were able to accomplish by hurting somebody else, and they want you to walk in that path with them. The Lord is warning us about these types of people. Look at verse 15. It says, whose ways are crooked... And they froward in their paths. Froward means crooked. The Bible defines itself. It, it's not forward, it's froward. Fro, forward is straight. Froward is crooked. So what is he saying? Whose ways are crooked and forward in their paths. They're not straight. They're not on the straight path, right? What are they on? They're on the movable path. They're all over the place. One minute they're here, the next minute they're over there. They're doing things crooked, deceitful, and again, to take innocency from people, to, to rejoice in doing evil. So he's telling us about bad friends. He did it in chapter 1 also. Now he shifts gears and he warns us about bad women. Look at verse 16. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even the stranger which flattereth with her words. Listen. Watch out, husbands. Pay attention, men. Single men especially. Watch out for this right here. There is a strange woman. She's a stranger to you. She has an evil intention. How can she get in your heart? By flattering you with her words. Oh, well, you're not like my husband. Oh, you're, st oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so brilliant. Oh, you're so talented. Listen, there are women that are going to puff you up and you have no business being around them. I think a lot of men initially know that. They see the red flag. Whoa, beware. Don't be near that. There's something wrong there. But what happens? They listen. They listen. Whoa, you're just so smart. You're so stylish. You're really, you really got it together. You're so sophisticated. Not like my husband. Or even if they're, you know, or just the single men especially need to be careful because there are women that if you listen to their flattery, you will stop being a soul winner. You will stop living for God. You will walk down her path instead of staying on the good path. Instead of being on the path that has life, you will be on the path that has death. He begins to warn about this. There are women. They're going to whisper in your ear just to keep you around. And it's very dangerous. They're sowing seeds that go down into your heart. And the next thing you know, the next, well, yeah, I guess I am pretty good looking. She's right. Boy, she knows what she, hey, be careful. Be cautious. Rebuke those thoughts when they come into your mind. Walk in the Spirit of God so you're strong enough to reject the flesh when things like this happen. Look at verse 17. Talking about her, it says, Which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Right? She knew. She's warned. She don't care. She's going to do it her way. Hold your finger here. Go to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. 
in Proverbs 30, it warns us, it says, Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. He's saying it's like they're, they're willing to do an evil sin and hurt somebody and somebody's family, and to them it's just like eating a meal. No big deal. That was no sin on me. I can do what I want. Right? Full of pride. Full of flattery. In Deuteronomy 23, it says, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both of these are an abomination unto the Lord. There is a woman that is a whore that is on par with a sodomite, a reprobate, a God-hater, and he's saying, don't be around them, don't bring them into the house, don't take any money from them, hey, don't take any flattery, because God says they're an abomination. Yep. There is a woman that is a whore that will flatter men with their mouth and destroy families, destroy mission, like single men that are on fire for God, they'll take that zeal from you and they'll, they'll destroy you. Look, you're in Numbers 25. Look at verse number 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began, listen, to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now, the daughters of Moab are unsaved. So they shouldn't even be looking at unsaved girls. That's called unequally yoked. God destroyed, hey, Genesis 1, they were unequally yoked. God destroyed them. Sons of God, sons of the devil, mating, he said, unacceptable. Sons of God should marry daughters of God. Daughters of God should marry sons of, hey, if you're not saved and you're, and you're one, hey, don't get married. Right? So first of all, that was unacceptable. They were even looking and considering. But the problem was bigger than just looking because they committed whoredom. They didn't marry them. They treated them like a whore. They themselves acted like a whore. It was fornication. God got very angry at his people for stepping outside of the boundaries of what he expected. Look at verse 2. And they called the people unto, unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. Listen, we're reading through, through Solomon's wisdom, and at the end of his life, what did he do? He hearkened unto the wives that had strange gods, and because they had physical power over him, he gave up his spiritual authority. Listen, single men, if some woman, you start messing around with some, single, some other woman that's not saved, number one, the judgment of God's on your life. He calls it a whoredom. He calls it fornication. You should be kicked out of a church for such a thing. But what will happen? She's going to say, come over to my gods. You're going to say, well, no, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a church guy. I go to church. I love God. I read the Bible. She's going to say, oh, you're so smart. You're so intelligent. Hey, answer my question. on. Oh, yeah, you really know your Bible. Why don't you come over to my house? Next thing you know, well, come with me to the bar. Why don't you come to this party with me? You're going to serve her gods, and what have you forsaken? Your God, the one true living God, because she's drawing you along like you're on a rope. You're just following the flesh. Look at verse 3. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the angel... I'm sorry, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and the Lord said unto Moses... Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. God is saying when a man starts following a whore, I want him dead. You ought to kill it. This is a strong word. God is very upset here. He's saying you need to stay focused on the things of the Lord. You are God's people you know, like a, a Christians should be kicked out of the church for it. 1 Corinthians 5, deliver such an one unto Satan. You want to whore around in a church? You want to commit fornication and be gods? That's okay. God will get you. He will destroy your body. He will, there's a sin unto death. He'll bring you home early. Look, if you don't want that, when that whore gets in front of your eyes, when she gets in your ear, men hate the evil. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. You know, thank God I read my Proverbs this morning. Which, oh, hey, hey, no, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thank God I read my Proverbs this morning. You know, the Bible warns against such things you're saying, ma'am. Lady, well, don't call them a lady if they're acting like a whore. There's a difference, right? God is saying that to kill them. He's saying hang them. Take the leaders, put a noose around their neck, and hang them up because they're committing whoredoms. They're going with strange women. God said you're worthy of death for doing that. Strong words. And I know some ladies say, well, you're using the word whore. Well, it's a Bible word. And ladies, you ought to love this preaching because it's going to make your man that much more 
obeying God and in love with you. Men, when you're tempted with a woman like that, you need to say, God, help me to get this thought out of here. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my family. Thank you for the wisdom in the Word of God that can preserve a family. Look at verse number five here. He says, And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. And in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he just sat around. He said, don't judge them. What did he do? Look, it says, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, so the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. You understand, the man of God saw something happening. He didn't sit around, well, it'll work itself out. Well, they might get married. Well, I know he brought that, that whorish, Moabitish woman that's not even saved into the church, but it's okay. She might get saved if we're loving enough and we don't judge her. That's not biblical. The Bible says when somebody's in fornication, you judge it. So what had the, man, the man of God stands up. He rises up. He does something about it. He puts an end to it. And guess what? The plague was stayed. 24,000 had to die so that the rest were preserved. Hey, a couple had to be kicked out so that the church had God's blessing on it. If that's what it comes down to, then that's what we're going to do. We want our children to be under the blessing of God. We want our houses to be blessed of God, and therefore we're going to judge righteously. We're going to walk that path of judgment. Keep your finger here. Go back to Proverbs chapter 2 real quick. We're almost done. Go back to Proverbs chapter 2. Look at verse 18 where we left off. It says, For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead right that's the dead path we're on the life path you want to stay alive stay away from that type of woman verse 19 none that go unto her return again neither take they hold of the paths of life keep your finger there and go to proverbs 7 i know you need three fingers now we're going to go back to numbers 25 He's saying, when a man starts walking down that path, he's not going to return. Well, but that's not true. I knew somebody that stepped out on his wife, and he came back. Yeah, but he's not returning the same. He's returning polluted, with leaven, with the curse of God on his life. God says he should die. He's not returning. He's not what he was. He's no longer on the path of life. He's polluted his mind. He's polluted his house. In Proverbs 7, find verse number 5. Again, about this strange woman, this whorish woman. He says, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Step one, get those words in your heart. Put it in your ear, get down in your heart, get in your mind, puff you up. Well, you're really something, aren't you? Beware when a woman is flirting with you, man. Beware when she's flattering you. Walk away from it. Rebuke her. Say, I want nothing to do with it. I don't feel right. I'm leaving. Go down to verse 10. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Why do women dress with whores and show off parts of their body that they shouldn't be showing? Because there's subtlety in their heart. They have an agenda. They count it as a success if they can cause a married man to look at them. Look at verse 11. Do you want this type of woman? It's not the kind you would bring home to mama. Look. She is loud and stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. Yeah, she's everywhere else. So she's on every corner. She's with any man. This is not the type of woman that you even logically want, but she wants to flatter you with words. She wants to draw you away by your own lust. She wants to show you parts of her body that you shouldn't be looking at, and we need to beware. We need to be warned. And listen, make sure your girls hate this sort of thing. Men, you're raising little girls. Make sure they hate the whorish woman. Make sure they don't bring in friends that dress like that because they're going to walk that path with them. They're going to be walking in parallel with that wicked path. Look at verse 21. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. 
Verse 21 is saying that it started with flattery, and how was she successful? With flattery. She forced. Force is a strong word. Flattery is a soft word. Force is a strong, there's a, there's a goal here. Why is there subtlety in her heart? Why is she showing parts of her body that should be covered up? She has an agenda. Look at verse 22. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. You ever seen a bull? You ever seen an ox heading to the slaughter? They don't know where they're going. They're just following the crowd. They're just, I don't know, where am I going? Listen, men, there's a warning here. In the flesh, you're not strong enough to resist this death. Be spiritually strong. Ask God to give you the wisdom to hate women like this, to hate women that would show their nakedness, to reject the flattery and the persuasion that will force you on the path of death. Look at the next verse, verse 23. Till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. You're walking into a death trap because you're following a woman with the attire of a harlot. Go back to Proverbs 2. Her house inclineth to death, her paths unto the dead. Verse 19, none that go under her return again, neither take they hold the paths of life. Proverbs 2.20, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of of the righteous. Why is he warning us about this so much? Go back to Numbers 25. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. Why is he saying beware of that? So that we can stay on that right path. So we can be around some men that we need to be around some good men. We don't need to be on that other path because we're going to cross paths with evil people. They want to hurt us. They want to destroy your family. And they're subtle in heart. They may not actively say, well, my goal is to get you to destroy your family. No. They just say, I, I want the pleasure of seeing somebody get some attention out of me. They want, they're just, the, the devil's already got them. Don't let the devil work through their mouth to get you off that path. Be around good men, not evil men. Look, in Numbers 25, where we left off, look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. While he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. That's a good man. He was zealous for God's sake. Look at the next verse. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. He rejected the evil man. He rejected the, the uh, adulterous woman. He got the covenant of peace with God. He had peace in his own house. Verse 13, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Go back to Proverbs 2. Everlasting priesthood. We will see this man, Phineas, one day in eternity. He will be working for God. He has great rewards in heaven. He will be serving with God in the new heaven and new earth. There are things that God will use. He's like, hey, I like this. This is a good man. We need to walk with this kind of man. He was zealous for God. He preserved a generation. And it said that he'll have that covenant of peace. And so will his children. When you decide to walk in the good path and not walk with evil men, then your children can have peace also. Those that refuse to bring, let peace come into their house, you might as well just put a curse on your children. We don't want cursed children. We want blessed children. And it starts with your actions and your decisions today. Verse 20, again, in Proverbs 2. That thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be, true, shall be rooted out of it. There's a dual application of this verse. He said, hey, the, the wicked, they're not going to live out half of their days, right? They're going to be full of disease and the curse of God on their life. But there's an eternal application. There's an immediate application, right? Children, you obey your parents, you'll have a blessed life. You'll live a longer life. Men, you obey the word of God and you focus on walking with good men instead of evil men. You'll have a covenant of peace on your household. But there's an eternal application here. You know, the Bible says that when the Lord returns, He will set up His kingdom. God will have a kingdom on this old earth before there's a new earth. 
And for greater than a thousand years, God will execute judgment. It'll be the perfect earth, nearly, if you will. It'll be sort of like it was in the Garden of Eden. In Revelation 5, he says, He hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, this is written in Revelation 5, and the people that are saying it, they're in heaven before the resurrection of the saints. This is before the rapture has taken place. And they're saying, we will reign on the earth. God has made us kings and priests, right? Phineas was an everlasting priesthood. He's in that everlasting priesthood. He says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. God has things that are yet to happen after the resurrection where we will reign with him, right? As it just said, we will inherit the earth. We're going to come back to this earth one day and rule with him and reign with him. And do you, want to, do you just want to be a, a nobody in his army? Do you want to be a peon? Or do you want to be one of his colonels, one of his generals, one of his priests, one of his prophets? It's up to you right now. Your history doesn't determine it. It's your future. It's your moment-by-moment -moment decisions to stay on the right path. We will be with him for eternity. You know, in Romans 15, he says, And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. There are things about Jesus Christ being the king that have not happened yet. And it's those prophecies that the Antichrist will point to. The rest of the world, because of the lack of their wisdom and the lack of knowledge and understanding of the Scriptures, they'll follow the Antichrist. Meanwhile, we will take some tribulation and say, this isn't it. This isn't supernatural. I don't have a new body yet. This isn't the Jesus I worship. That's not my God. God will give us the wisdom to see through those things. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, he says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. God will reign over this earth one day. We will reign with him. What type of a leadership position do you want to have with God? It starts with your decisions right now staying on the good path, the path of life. Stay away from the path of darkness. Stay away from that evil man. Stay away from that whorish woman and trust the Lord to give you the wisdom to stay on the right path. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the book of Proverbs. Lord, thank you for giving me the, the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom to even preach it, Lord. Lord, your ways are above our ways and if there's anything good that I've said tonight, it's because of you. Lord, you deserve all the credit. You wrote it. You love us. You want us to grow. And I believe it starts with us making sure we stay on the right path. Lord, we love you. We thank you. I pray you keep everybody safe as we leave from here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.